Thanks for tuning in for this message from Momentum Church. We invite you to subscribe to this feed to receive a steady stream of encouragement, inspiration and wisdom from God's Word. The title of the sermon is this, if you want to write it down or you want to, I don't know if it's recorded or what. The title of the sermon is this, do you ever, ever feel like giving up and walking away? Now this sermon is, is two-sided tonight. We usually want to give up at the brink of breakthrough. It's always, always at that moment, something is about to happen. And as I was praying today, the Lord really revealed many things to me. But one of these was this, we almost give up when the fulfillment of the promise is about to take place. We almost and the enemy always wants us to give up for us not to see the promise being fulfilled. And so many people I know over the years, friends, colleagues, walked away at critical moments. They had believed for years for the promise to be fulfilled. They had stood on the promise, but life, experience, situation, circumstances pushed them off the track. A lot of them today, I, I often meet them, my own brother, I often meet them, don't go to church, not involved, not interested, because they were believing that the promise would be fulfilled. But can I just say this tonight, in God... There's a time frame. We, we read about in Ecclesiastes, there's a time for everything. But when it comes to God, he has a time frame to fulfill the promise. But we often have our own time frame. And sometimes we are almost um, angry when our time frame is not met by God's time frame. You see, the Bible says that we all know that God knows the beginning and the end of everything. But in God, and I want you to get this, in God there's always a second chance. Can I say that? There's always a second chance and it always comes back around somewhere. But often when it's coming around, we have positioned ourselves outside of the promise. It's very important to understand that sometimes you've got to position yourself, align yourself in God's time frame for you to see the promise being fulfilled. Now, you don't, I, I know the verse is off by heart. In the book of Joshua, chapter 1, you don't have to go there. God says to Joshua, today my servant Moses has died. Now, therefore, arise and now go into the promised land. Moses never saw the promised land. He saw it from a distance. He tasted the goods. In Numbers chapter 13, he tasted the fruit of the land. But he never saw the fulfillment of the promise that God had actually given to Abraham. Abraham never saw the fullness of it. Moses never saw the fullness of it. Now we can go in to ask the reason why Moses, but here's the thing. Moses didn't see it. So here's Joshua, 40 years later, after being in the promised land, after stepping into the promised land, he's taken from the promised land. Him and Caleb are taken from the promised land. 11 other men on that journey, or 9 other men, 11 other men, decide that this is not what God has for us. And therefore they lose sight of the promise and they never see the promise being fulfilled and a whole generation never see the fulfillment of the promise that God had promised Abraham because in God there's a time frame there's a moment when all of a sudden something opens 
And all of a sudden you step in. And the promise doesn't just seem something from a far away. But all of a sudden now the promise is now your reality. But for some reason, most people I journey with over 30 years always seem to step out of the promise just at that moment it's about to be their reality. Joshua is standing there. He lost the whole generation. He lost his best friend. And now God is saying, now is the time for you, after all these years, it's time for you to arise and take the next generation into the fullness of the promised land. Remember this. When God wants you to get that promise, it's not always for you. It's usually for others around you. And often it's for a generation. As as we speak today, there's a generation that we are now responsible for. So it is our responsibility that we stay on course and that we stay and that we run the race that God has presented before us. But for some reason, the enemy seems to always know how to press a button or cause the circumstances or bring a situation into your world that at some point you decide, I cannot go any further. I'm done. Years ago, I was telling her years ago, I invited a professor to do a weekend for me in my church. And a great crowd gathered that Saturday morning. It was Pastor Michael Williams, his wife, me, my wife, an old lady that played with the piano, ding, ding, ding. And one other person, there were six of us in the room. Nobody showed up. I'm playing the piano, the same song I've played for 10 years, playing the same song. And in my head, I'm saying, Lord, I'm actually done with this. I've had enough. I've given you everything. I've given you my money. I've given you my time. I've given you my family. I've given you my future. I've given you everything. I am finished with this. This is not working. Maybe I'm not the man for the job. And he stood up. He didn't know what was in my head. And he said, today I'm going to speak. And he he preached as if there was 10,000 people. He was a tremendous preacher. And he stood up and he preached. He said, have you ever been disappointed by God? And he preached on that text. My God, my God, why art thou forsaken? And he preached for an hour on that text. And after I'm sitting on a piano and I'm, my head is melted, I'm thinking, I have to give this up. I'm finished. I'm done. He puts his hand on his shoulder and he said, he doesn't know what's in my head. He said, son, listen to me. Don't give up. Don't give up. God's promise will be fulfilled. God takes his promise very serious. As Joshua stands there, think for a second. He had seen the promise. He had tasted the promise. He's 83, 84, and now he stands on the brink of the fulfillment. Now listen, you've got to get this. The fulfillment that God had spoken to Abraham almost more than four or five hundred years later he's standing on the brink often we stand on the brink of the fulfillment of a promise maybe that God gave you ten years ago maybe twenty years ago maybe thirty years ago maybe ten days ago maybe ten weeks all of a sudden we're standing we're in this position we're standing and all of a sudden we can almost taste it we're on the brink of the fulfillment that God had promised but often We step back. We slide back. 
she said something, he said something, she did something, she looked at me a certain way. You know this Christian stuff, he ignored me, maybe he's got loads of issues. He didn't even say hello to me, the pastor didn't even look at me that Sunday, so you know, he can go and... Do you know what I mean? We have to, and then we walk out and then we say, and you too, I'm finished with you as well. <laughs> Hello? We do it all the time. But here's the thing, the enemy loves to take you off track from you seeing the fullness of the promise being full. You see, when Joshua stands there, he's not just going to enter into it, he's going to claim it. Second point. A promise is a promise, but it's never fulfilled until you enter into the promise, but then you have to claim the promise. Hallelujah. You've got to claim the promise. We often hear this verse, Paul says, the promise of God, a yes and amen to them that believe. Believe is an action. Believe is not some notion, some idea. Faith where it works is dead. So in other words, if you really believe something, you've got to claim it. You've got to take it as it's your own. You've got to believe that this is your promise. That no matter what you're facing, no matter what they're saying, no matter what circumstance is in your world, you are not just going to enter into the promise. You're actually going to claim the promise. And usually the promise is for you, for your family, for your marriage, and for your kids. So it's my responsibility that I must not enter, just enter into the promise, but I must claim that promise. You see, you've got to claim it. Joshua didn't just get up that day and walk in. He claimed the promise that he knew that had been promised to him 40 years prior, four dec decades later. He's now about to enter in, not just enter into the promise, but now he's about to claim the promise that he had tasted 40 years prior. Now I want to tell you something, friend. God always brings his plan around again and again and again and again and again and again and again. But we have to enter it and then we have to claim it. It's not enough just to enter in and say God will fulfill. No, friend. We partner with heaven. And therefore, partnership with heaven means we have a responsibility to take ownership of the promise that God has put inside of us. Oh, hallelujah. You got to take it, you got to enter it, and then you got to claim it. Hallelujah. You got to stop listening to the voice of the enemy. You got to stop listening to your own voice, your own words, and start listening to the promise that God has actually promised you. It's not enough, friend, just to enter in. You got to claim it, you got to take ownership of it. So when you look back at Joshua and Caleb 40 years prior, they allowed nine or ten of their men to, to almost push them aside and say, no, 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 there's giants in the land, there's this in the land, so therefore, Joshua, we are not going in to get that land. Joshua retracts. You see, it takes real courage to claim what God has actually promised. People say to me all the time, where's God? Christians, I, I get sick of it. Where's God? Where's God? Where's God? And later I say, where are you? I love what T.D. Jakes says. Someone came to T.D. Jakes. I'm waiting on God to build me a, build me a table. T.D. Jakes turns around and says, your man, he's built you a tree. So go and chop down the tree and build your own table. That's us, isn't it? Give me a tree. Give me a table. Get off your, your, your legs. Do a skip. And that's the truth. We want everything done for us. We're not taking any responsibility. We take no ownership. And therefore what happens is we get discouraged. We get disillusioned. And then we walk out that door. He probably hasn't said to you. Maybe he's going through a hard time. We walk out the door and we say not nice Christian things. And then we never come back. And then we tell everyone that church thing doesn't work. That Christianity thing doesn't work. And definitely that God thing doesn't work. What about our responsibility? Now let me just show you quickly. God says to Joshua, Joshua, he's dead. So let's forget the past. <laughs> Moses represented the generation that was lost. 
Moses represents the man that never fulfilled the promise. So therefore, he says, that's over now, Joshua. I want you now to step out of that, take all these people, and go in and enter the promise and claim the promise. Now, you would think God is being very harsh, but here's the thing. The Bible says in Isaiah, God watches over, stands over his word, makes sure it is actually fulfilled. So God is more interested, not in the dead, in the living. (laughs) He doesn't, now that's probably the wrong one, not care, but Moses is in eternity at that point. So therefore, that's a done deal. So he's more interested than that generation that's under Joshua's leadership to go in and enter the promise and claim the promise. And my third point quickly is this, not does he enter the promise, not does he claim the promise, but now he conquers the promise. So therefore, God is more interested in you claiming claim, claiming, and now conquering the promise. When I was a kid, my two older brothers used to say to me, I'm going to give you 50p tomorrow. Every day I'd go, where's the 50p, lads? Oh, no, tomorrow. The idiot would go every day. Have you got the 50p? Tomorrow. Tomorrow never came. They never gave me the 50p. They still owe it to me today. One's in eternity. The other fellow's backslidden. I'll never see that ever fulfilled. Because they were, they were, they were just giving me lip service. There was, no, there was no reality in what they were saying. See, we say a lot of things, but we very rarely do many things. We stand, we look at the promise, we look at the promise, we look at the promise, we look at the promise for our life, for our marriage, for our home, for our situation, for our church, for our community. And we stand and we look at it, we look at it, and we pray, we pray, we pray, we pray, we pray. And we're waiting on God to do something for that promise to become a reality when heaven has done it all. (laughs) There's no more Jesus can do here. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. It's like I have these two ladies in church and they're always saying to me, I'd love to meet someone, I'd love to meet someone, I'd love to meet someone. And I said, have you ever done anything about it? Now what do you mean I've prayed? I said, well, praying's not working, is it? And I said, have you ever gone onto a site like a, a Christian site, meet boys and girls? No, I've never done that. So what do you expect, they said? Do you think they're just going to walk in the door? I said, no, no, you have a responsibility to see your desire fulfilled. If you believe that God has promised you to meet someone, well, then it's your responsibility and your ownership to do something in order to see that fulfilled. But for some reason, in our psyche, we think that's wrong. Yet God says to Joshua, get up and go in. Take the land. There's going to be loads of joints in there. There's going to be loads of issues in there. But I want you not just to claim it, but I want you to conquer it. You see, friend, God wants you to claim your promise, but also conquer that promise. But for some mad reason, we have this idea, well, that's a bit hard work. No, 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 no. It's not hard work. It's reality. It's reality. You know, Jesus went to some length for you to have that promise fulfilled. He went to some length. He he went to some place. He was butchered. He was bruised. He was rejected. He was slaughtered. He was hung on a cross. He was pierced at the side. And he was left in a mess. The Bible says that he was so disfigured that nobody could even recognize. And he did all of that for you to know that the promises of God are yes and amen to those who claim it and walk in and conquer. Hallelujah. That's the reality of the gospel. Paul says, I am going to Rome. I'm going. Peter stands in front of Jesus. That's an insane thing to do. Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. There was this sense of, I'm going. Now let me do this quickly. Last point. It's a standing joke with me in a hurry. He said, many last points do you have? You just keep pulling them out of your jacket. And my wife was here. She'd be at the back saying, finish. 
Let God be God. <laughs> Amen. Years ago, I was told, when I was a kid, I was told this. You're stupid. Leave the school. Please don't come back. You've caused so many issues in this school. Hopefully you don't end up in this, 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 this. I went to Bible school. The day I entered Bible school, the academic dean says, how come you got here? Or look at him, what? He says, you're going to fail. Wow, thanks. <laughs> Christian. Then I get into the Bible school. I go to Belgium. They said, I'm going to fail there. Then I go into ministry, and I'm walking through Dublin City, and an old lady that used to, used to decide with me says to me, you're going to fail in that church like all the other pastors. So the best thing you could do is give it up and walk away and come back to your, your mother church. And all the while, I'm hearing all these voices, but yet the biggest voice I hear is the promise that God had given to me. You see, with the promise will always come opposition. The moment he steps into the promised land, the moment he claims that land, he's faced with an issue. Joshua's faced with an issue when he comes to the wall of Jericho. Straight away, he's he's confronted with, you're not claiming this land. I'm going to throw opposition in your world, and I'm going to rob the promise of God from your life. So I'm standing at 20, 30 years of age, just married, took over a church, no money, no people, no worship team, the building is in bits, and I'm there, and everyone's telling me you're going to fail. But somewhere in me is the promise that God had given to me, saying, son, you obey me, you walk with me, and I will bless you. So I had to ignore all the voices. I had to ignore all the people that would influence my Christian life as a young Christian. And not just ignore them, but I would actually cut them off. And let me tell you this, and you've got to get this. Uh, when Joshua rises that day, he cuts off the past. The past has no future in the present or in the future. The problem with Moses, we're still hanging on there. Let's bring a bit of this crap with us. Let's bring a bit of that garbage. The good old days. They weren't good. I have loads of it. Remember, the, no, they weren't good. I, don't, they were not good days for me. They were broken days. I was a mess in those days. I needed redemption in those days. So I want to tell you, friend, in order to get hold of the promise that it becomes your reality, you've got to cut a line in the sand and say, what was is over. I'm standing in the present. I'm full of the promise. And I'm going to go in and claim it. And then I'm going to conquer it. And the last point is this. And I'm going to see the victory of the promise being fulfilled in my reality, in my time frame, that everyone can see that God is a God of promise. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let me tell you, friend, he is the God of promise, and there's a time frame with God, and all he's asking for you and me is to stay in that time frame, position ourselves in his time frame, align ourselves with the word of God, align ourselves with the promise of God, enter into it, claim it, conquer it, and see the victory of it being your reality, and that everyone can see that God is a God that keeps his word. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. So you better not give up and you better not give in because you're on the brink of the fulfillment of the promise that God has promised you. Maybe 10, 20, 30, maybe 50 years. God will perform that word. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says, and I close now, I promise you, I give you a promise. I shall fulfill it. It will become your reality. You will claim it. You will conquer it. And you will enter into it. And she says, Amen. She says, The service closed about 10 o'clock. Hurry up, Pastor B. Here's the drill deal. The enemy loves not to rob your salvation because that's a done deal. 
That's it on deal. But he hates the believer living in the reality of the promises of God. He hates it. That's why in John 10, 10, he says, he comes to rob, to kill, and destroy the promises of God. He loves to rob it. He tells you all the time, your church will never work. Your church will never go anywhere. No one will ever come in and worship this place. Everyone hates you. No one likes your preaching. No one likes your songs. No one likes you. And as I said last night, it's the Goliath speaking volumes into your head. Goliath loves to just scream in your brain. But this is what I love about Joshua. He's 85. Caleb's with him. They enter him. They claim it. They conquer it. And they destroy the inhabitants in the land. Friend, we are called to be more than conquerors. Not this feeble, miserable excuse for a Christian. That's half alive, half dead. Can't get out of bed to pray. Can't pick up the Bible. Can't go to prayer meeting. Can't help with the church service. Can't help with putting the chairs in. Seriously. Even when I was drinking, I was at church at the time. I used to go to the church at the time with a hangover. I used to help when I was dying sick with a hangover. I still help. Why? Because somewhere in me I wanted to help the church grow and to become something special and that it would affect society and see people's lives change and transform and set free and release. Hallelujah. God's intention, Fred, is that you become a liberated Christian that lives and breathes the promises of God. Everything else outside is a tragedy. God wants His promises fulfilled. In your world, in your marriage, in your home, in your lifetime. I, I, I had a brother, you know, I had a brother who died 12 years ago, 14 years ago. And as he's going into a turn, he says, do me a favor. I said, what's that? He said, please make sure you fulfill the promises. I didn't. He's 47, going to heaven. He's a Christian. And he says those words, make sure you fulfill the promises that God has actually given to you. I'm not. I don't want to end and go to eternity saying they never became a reality. They never became fruitful. They never became evident. They were some idea, some notion, almost like a, reading a fiction book. It wasn't really real. I want my children saying, my father saw the promise. My father lived the promise. My father claimed the promise. My father conquered the promise. My father was victorious in the promise. My father lived, breathed, acted, talked, taught, and lived the promises of God. That no matter what he faced, no matter what came his way, he kept on going and believed that in the time of God, in the perfect will and time of God, the promise will, will be fulfilled. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's wake up, Christian. Let's be more than conquerors. Let's be overcomers. Let's be men and women of God of valor that we believe the promise, that we live the promise, that we speak the promise, that we think about the promise, and that we execute the promise. Hallelujah. And that it becomes your reality. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, rabba, re, salaba, rokoba, rabba. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. God wants you to wake up. God wants you to get up. God wants you to live, breathe the promise of God that no matter what you face, no matter what you endure, no matter what person speaks, whatever, you don't listen. You don't even respond to it. You respond and you react to the promise of God. And you say to yourself, Lord, I believe your word. I believe you said this. No matter what she says, no matter what he's, your word is a promise. Your word is faithful. Your word is accurate. Your word is truth. Your word is liberate. Your word is amazing. That's God. That's the reality of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that went to the cross, that was raised on the third day, that ascended to heaven. And one day he's coming back for a great bride. He's coming back for a perfect bride. He's coming back for a powerful bride. Oh, hallelujah. That's who I serve. That's what I truly, truly believe after all these years. He is faithful to his 
promises. Amen. You've been listening to a message from Momentum Church. To get in touch, visit our website, momentumchurch.com.au or search Momentum Church Gold Coast on Facebook. Facebook.